overturning the culture of violence. This presentation is put together by the African People's Solidarity Committee, the organization of white people formed by the African People's Socialist Party, which leads the Uhuru movement for the liberation of Africa and African people everywhere. All the information and analysis in this presentation come from the theory of Chairman Omalia Shatella, who leads the African People's Socialist Party. a world that is constructed of the theft of the resources, both material and human, of African and other people as a consequence of its existence. Stealing black labor, black bodies, black territory, of the rape of Asia, Latin America, etc. It's a rotten, foul social system. That's the world we live in. And if you raise the question of reparations, it makes it necessary for African people to come to terms with this. So much is done against us all the time. Demoralizing black people. You took my money, you took my resources, you stole every damn thing we got, I want it back. In the news every day, we see violence, war, suffering, death, and poverty perpetrated by U.S. and Western imperialism. All around the world, people are struggling and resisting this violence, struggling to regain their land, resources, and self-determination. These are struggles for national liberation. To understand the origins of the violence, war, and suffering in the world today, we must understand history. <laughs> Africa is the birthplace of all humanity and human civilization. Science, architecture, art, music, philosophy, religion, and mathematics originated in Africa. The Sphinx is thought by many scholars to be at least 12,000 years old. When King Tutankhamun was alive about 3,500 years ago, the Sphinx was already extremely ancient. The first date on the Egyptian calendar was more than 3,000 years before the rise of Greece and Rome. What are known as Greek philosophical, scientific, and mathematical concepts came directly from Africa. Ancient Africans discovered geometry, physics, and astronomy, and discovered what is now called the Fibonacci series and the Golden Mean, used by artists, architects, mathematicians, and scientists down through the ages until today. Africa had equitable, hospitable societies. There is no history of jails, prisons, or poverty. Visitors were welcomed from around the world. African society was matrilineal, a man married into a woman's family. The African civilization of Mali from 1235 to 1645 AD covered most of West Africa. It had enormous influence in the whole world. One of its cities, Timbuktu, was a center of learning. Scholars came from around the world to study and to enjoy the lively social and artistic culture. Mansa Musa was one of the famous rulers of Mali in the 1300s. He brought architects and scholars into Mali. His rule was known for prosperity and social justice, as well as for artistic, educational, and technological achievement. In the Middle Ages and ancient times, Europe was a cold, backwards, barren land of violent, warring tribes. Medieval Europe was governed by the system of feudalism. The majority of the population lived as serfs, impoverished farm workers tied to the land owned by the lords and the aristocracy. Most of Europe was known for its filth, violence, and stench. The majority of people never bathed, had rotting teeth, open sores, and pockmarks. Alcoholism was rampant. Women and children were powerless and oppressed. While the Middle Ages in Europe are known as the Dark Ages, in the rest of the world, great civilizations flourished. Mali and Songhai in Africa, the Mongol Empire which united China with most of Asia, the Islamic civilization in the Middle East, and the Mayan and Aztec civilization in the Americas. The most progressive and developed part of Europe in the Middle Ages was Andalusia, Spain, which was ruled by Africans and Arabs. 
At the end of the 11th century, Europeans launched the first crusade against North Africa in the hope of conquering its immense riches and power. For 200 years, the brutal and violent crusades brought stolen resources into Europe, sparking what is known as the Renaissance. The Crusades, a so-called holy war against African and Arab people, defined the consciousness of Europe as white and Christian. In the 1340s, the plague wiped out nearly half the population of Europe, destroying its already weak economy. Europe's population continued to decline for a hundred years. In 1415, Henry the Navigator began sending out fleets to West Africa from Portugal to gain control of the wealthy West African trade in gold, silver, and other resources. The Trans-Saharan trade routes had flourished for a millennia, connecting Africa to the Middle East and Asia. The Portuguese began the kidnapping of African people, turning a whole continent of people into a commodity. By the early 1500s, Portugal had extracted 700 tons of African gold, shipping it to Portugal, and had kidnapped more than 81,000 African people into slavery. Christopher Columbus was a slave trader who sailed to the Americas financed by Queen Isabella and the Spanish crown in 1492. Isabella had to hawk her jewels to raise the money. While Columbus was the colonial viceroy in the Caribbean, he oversaw the slaughter of 8 million indigenous people. When Columbus landed in the Americas, he was welcomed by the indigenous people, but he and his men soon began systematic genocide of the people, raping the women and terrorizing the population with dogs trained to rip them to death. Also in 1492, Spain initiated the brutal Inquisition, pushing Africans, Arabs, and Jews out of Spain in another assertion that Europe was a white and Christian nation. In 1518, Bartolomé de las Casas, a Catholic priest in South America, called on the Spanish crown to use Africans as slaves in the Caribbean and South American colonies rather than the indigenous people who were being subjected to systematic genocide. Spain then dominated the international trade in African people. De Las Casas advised that incentives be given to European settlers to stimulate the economy in the so-called West Indies. Any settler who built a sugar mill was allowed to import 20 Africans to be used as enslaved laborers to work in the mills. In the 1560s, the English began their trade in African people. Sir John Hawkins was the famous British pirate in this period who challenged Spain's monopoly of the human trade. On the right is John Hawkins' coat of arms. The six-month, 3,700-mile voyage from Africa to the Americas called the Middle Passage was sheer torture for the human cargo with hundreds of Africans on a ship. This is an actual photo of children on a slave ship dated 1868. Men, women, and children were captured in their homeland and held in dungeons for months. They were chained into the holds of ships, spoonways, or stacked on top of each other on pallets with the hideous stench of open pits of human waste. The pallets, seen on the lower left, were no more than 15 inches high. On the right is the infamous Door of No Return of the Gore Island Slave Castle, where Africans were brutally held until transported to the Americas. During what is known as the Middle Passage, hundreds of thousands of African people died of disease or starvation, or were murdered for attempted resistance and thrown overboard to the schools of sharks that followed the ships from Africa to the Americas. The ship owners were reimbursed for the deaths of African people by the newly emerging insurance companies such as Lloyd's of London. At the same time, hundreds of millions of indigenous people were wiped out throughout the Americas and the Caribbean by the European invasion, with the enthusiastic participation of regular white citizens. The U.S. slaughter at Wounded Knee in 1890 was carried out by white volunteer cavalry. Indigenous people were murdered, their bodies left frozen in the snow or piled up into mass graves. <laughs> 
The U.S. waged more than 60 so-called Indian Wars in an attempt to wipe out indigenous resistance and the indigenous people themselves. Jose 